lot of meetings are taking place today. So I'm really glad that those of you who are here were able to come and join us um, for what is our inaugural, meaning our first of what is going to be a monthly series called Tech Policy Rising. This is going to be a series where we bring together policy and technological experts to talk about really, really new, um, on the edge of becoming news or having just made news um, developments. Right now we're talking about user-side encryption. Um, I'm not going to use the mic because I think you can all hear me okay. Um, joining me are Julian Sanchez from the Cato Institute and Matt Blaze from the University of Pennsylvania. So I'm going to ask to introduce themselves in just a minute. Um, before that, though, I'm going to ask um, on your way out if you could all pick up a sheet that looks like this. This is our second in the series that we're announcing today. Um, it's going to be on December 11th, featuring Marcy Wheeler from MTWheel.net and Chris Devoyan, the Chief Technologist at the ACLU, on location tracking. Um, and we'll be announcing some more details on that, but the initial information is on the sheet outside. So Julian, you want to do your short introduction? Sure. I'm uh, Julian Sanchez, a senior fellow at uh, Cato Institute, and uh, is a uh, uh, libertarian think tank uh, just down the street. Uh, and uh, I actually came over from uh, um, uh, journalism where I covered uh, many of these issues, privacy, surveillance, encryption, uh, for the uh, site Ars Technica, uh, before that was a, a blogger uh, for The Economist, uh, and uh, had a sort of childhood background in geek work when I ran a dial up BBS uh, back in 2001. So uh, I'm Matt Blaze. Uh, I'm a professor at, of computer science at uh, UPenn, and mostly I do uh, cryptography and uh, computer security related um, things, which for the last 15 years has meant having one foot in policy because there's been a lot of policy stuff around uh, these issues as I think everybody here knows. So today we're talking about user-side encryption. Um, a lot of you have probably read this in the news a lot lately, um, stemming from the incident where Apple has decided that they're going to provide um, encryption for their iPhones by default. Um, and James Comey, who's the director of the FBI, came out and said that this is going to cause all sorts of problems for law enforcement. Um, problems that I don't think are, are very new, as we'll hear, I think, in a little bit. But if we can start with Matt, and if you can tell us a little bit about not only what Apple is proposing, but generally what is user-side encryption, what that encompasses, and how it gives more power to individuals. Right. Okay. So um, the uh, announcement by Apple that sparked a lot of these from the FBI um, was essentially uh, uh, the, the most surprising thing in Apple's announcement, which was that uh, Apple would no longer be able to decrypt uh, iPhones and iPads um, if uh, the user doesn't have the password for the device um, without, you know, without the user's password. Um, and the most surprising thing to me about that announcement was that they could do that in the first place, uh, because that's actually a, a fairly surprising uh, uh, design. It's a more complicated design if uh, you want to design something so that the password can be bypassed in some way. Uh, the simplest way of achieving this is to just have the password be used um, to unlock an encryption key uh, that can only be unlocked with, with the password itself. If you had um, you know, a second way of doing it, that's a much more complex and cumbersome design um, that didn't actually add any value um, to the user because Apple didn't advertise that they had this capability. So if you lost your own password, you couldn't go to Apple to, to, to have them recover it for you because you know they didn't tell you that, uh, that they could do this in the first place. They, this was a service that they only provided to law enforcement and possibly for their own internal uh, uh, development use, but it was never, uh, never a selling point of the product, although conceivably a feature like that could be. Um, what, the, um, what this password, this encryption key protected, was any data stored on the phone and
handset or the tablet itself. It wasn't um, used to protect, you know, the contents of phone calls or uh, the, um, uh, the text messages or any communication contact that you were exchanging with someone else. This key was exclusively for protecting, you know, files uh, that were stored on your machine, things like your address book and um, chat logs and, and things like that. So this was not the master encryption key for all, um, all interaction with the device, just for data stored on the device. Um, now, when uh, Apple announced that they were, you know, essentially um, making their design simpler, by removing this extra decryption capability. Um, the FBI and, and people who were speaking effectively on behalf of the FBI's position, you know, um, you know were, were advancing the idea that this was some kind of a standard feature that any manufacturer would include by default. Um, and that removing it was, you know, a, a, an active act of hostility towards law enforcement. But in fact, you know, having this capability in the first place is really the unusual design. Um, and, you know, removing it is sort of just bringing the, the Apple design back to what you would normally expect and how you would design something like this um, if, if you were just trying to build a, a product for people to use. I, doubt it. Actually, it's sort of important to understand the nature of the change Apple made in the way iOS functions because I think some of the descriptions uh, in the popular press give you the impression that what Apple previously had done is provided a sort of specific backdoor capability for this very purpose, for uh, providing information to law enforcement. Now they have removed what was previously a backdoor. Um, I think it would be more accurate, accurate to describe it, uh, what they've done, as fixing a design flaw right. uh, in, in the system. Previously, so before iOS 8, this is the sort of by default fully device encrypted uh, version of iOS. The way it worked is that there were several so-called encryption classes. So a lot of the data on the device was already unretrievably encrypted with a key based on a mingling of keys stored, one hopes, securely in a chip on the device itself and, and that was mingled with the user's passcode, so that uh, you didn't have the full key unless you had the user passcode. Um, and so email, for example, was already encrypted in that unbreakable fashion with no backdoor for Apple. There was another class of encryption they used for things like your address book contacts and your photos for whatever reason, which their own internal white papers call the file protection none category of encryption. So if you look at their technical white paper, they say, uh, yeah, this is basically a weak kind of encryption. It still encrypts the data, but because the keys are stored on the device itself, if someone gets physical access to the device, uh, this is not a form of protection that would provide that much uh, security against a sophisticated attacker. Apple is, of course, itself the most sophisticated attacker. Um, using their developer key, uh, they were able to install essentially a custom bootloader that bypassed uh, the passcode screens and forced the device to use its own stored uh, encryption keys to unlock the stuff that wasn't locked with that intermingled key or entangled key, as they call it. Um, so, uh, in a way, they were just sort of catching up to the design that Android phones had already implemented, and the design that is you know, certainly standard on your laptop. Uh, you, you know, if you encrypt your Mac laptop with a file vault, unless you've chosen to back up your key, the default is um, you, know, you, you better. Uh, write it down or memorize it somewhere because uh, there's no other way to bypass that if you uh, if you don't have the passphrase. Yeah. So so I just want to yeah <coughs> re-emphasize um, that you know the ability to you know, have this sort of second uh, way of unlocking the key uh, wasn't you know you could imagine. Apple might advertise that, hey, if you lose your key, don't worry, just bring it to an Apple store and we can unlock it for you. Uh, and that might be a value-added feature that some people might say that makes, makes it better, and other people might say, no, I don't want that. But that's not what Apple was doing here. They were, um, you know, this was effectively a secret capability that, that was only for Apple internal use, and it turns out for, for law enforcement. And the effect was it made the design of the 
the phone and the design of the software uh, on the phone much more complicated than it would otherwise uh, have to be without that capability. So it not only provided a second way in to get to the data, which, which carries with it some risks, but it also um, made the system, the security system, more complicated and as a result, more vulnerable to inadvertent bugs and design errors and, uh, and, and other kinds of vulnerabilities. So in fact, you know, by removing this, they made the system more secure in at least two ways. Uh, the second, you know, the first is that they removed the explicit backdoor uh, way of somebody decrypting your files. And the second is they removed um, additional complexity and additional code that very well may have had inadvertent flaws that would allow somebody to get in. So this was, you know, from a user point of view, very much an improvement in the security of the, of the phone handset. So Matt alluded earlier to um, Comey's remarks that I referenced in my opening. Can you talk, Julian, a little bit about what specifically James Comey objects to in this and how this kind of builds upon arguments that the FBI has made for years, if not decades, going sure. back? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the FBI has been going dark uh, because of encryption for a very long time, at least since the uh, early 90s, which makes this a, uh, a twilight both more, more, uh, more protracted and, and less plausible than the, uh, even the the Teenage Sparkly Vampire series. Uh, back in, in 1992, the uh, Advanced Telephony Unit at FBI predicted that within three years, 40% uh, of their telephonic intercepts would be uh, effectively un unreadable or unintelligible because of unbreakable encryption. Um, that the uh, apocalypse is sort of perpetually nigh that has not yet uh, arrived. Um, so this is, in a way, a rehash of those claims. We'll say it is probably more plausible now. That it, we're not talking about sort of secure phones, let's say, used by a, um, a handful of businesses with uh, an extraordinary need for security, but um, default strong encryption on widely used consumer devices that you would more often encounter the problem that uh, you know a device physically obtained during a search by law enforcement uh, would not be readable without the cooperation of, uh, the, of the suspect. Uh, and that is, you know, again, a sort of theoretically not wildly implausible claim, although I do note that uh, every instance that, certainly in the speech uh, and yielded to it at the Brookings Institution um, and in various sort of op-eds we've seen from law enforcement, talking about instances where, uh, but for the ability to access the stored data on the phone, they would have been stymied, um, and the investigation would not have been able to move forward, uh, those have just not stood up to scrutiny. And so each of those examples, you look and find that, in fact, uh, the data that was used was either not obtained from a smartphone or was not really critical to the case. There was plenty of other physical evidence. Um, so, you know, so, so theoretically there must be such a case, um, but it is probably telling that they can't seem to find one um, you know, actually in, in their case files. Um, it is, again, true, I think, that, that they will encounter, and this is an obstacle in some of their investigations, um, yet at the same time uh, they have you know, vastly more data available to them because more data about our transactions is stored uh, in the cloud or is on the phone and may be encrypted that someone can be threatened with contempt of court and uh, you know, thrown in a jail cell if they refuse a lawful court order to uh, decrypt their device. Um, so it's, it's not clear how many circumstances we're going to find where um, there isn't a way law enforcement can either get the data they need to make their case um, from another venue where they can make their case without that data, or where simply the ability to legally compel someone um, is, is enough to get someone to, to kick off up the passcode. So this is interesting because shortly before, I believe it was before Apple made the device encryption announcement, Apple was in the headlines for something totally different. And that was having iCloud be hacked and a lot of celebrity photos be released. So you had a major security incident followed by a major security announcement, and then the revelation that that could stymie law enforcement. Matt, can you tell us kind of the difference, why it's not really equivocal to say that the device encryption would have stopped the iPhone hack, and 
the techno technology behind what Julian is saying are other alternatives, other venues for which law enforcement can right. get information. Right. So, you know, I think a Apple's announcement that they were removing the backdoor capability wasn't, you know, wasn't directly a, um, a, a, a fix for the iCloud hack, but it's certainly, you know, in the related category. You know, the, um, uh, we're creating an enormous amount of data that uh, these, you know, mobile devices in particular are handling. And, you know, mobile devices um, in particular are inherently insecure. We carry them around, we keep them in pockets, we leave them on uh, tables, um, we leave them on trains, as I did this morning. Um, <laughs> I think and, I'm sitting on the desk right and, now. <laughs> uh, um, you know, so somebody, if, if you find an iPhone 5S an, on an Amtrak seat, uh, <laughs> give me a call. Um, the, um, but fortunately, you know, as a as a drug dealer, I guess I carry two phones. Um, but um, the uh, you know these devices are you know contain uh, 